All right, so just letting a few more folks roll in here before we get this thing started, but we're stacking up the numbers already pretty well. Already got several hundred people uh, in attendance, so that's great to see. Let's give her another few seconds here before we start rocking and rolling. Pretty cool to see that number jump up so fast. It's going to be a lot of people wanting to learn from Mr. Kaiser how to shoot more coyotes. All right, guys. So I'm just going to, I'm going to jump into this right now. Um, first of all, we're super glad that you can join us tonight for this hunt class. Um, we've done several of these now and we plan to keep them rolling because the attendance has been great. Feedback has been awesome across the board. And so, uh, you can expect to see a lot more of these coming down the line from hunt stand. Um, like I just said a minute ago, got hundreds of folks uh, joining us tonight from all corners of the country. And I know we've even got some folks coming in from Canada. So super good turnout. And I think uh, a lot of you are here for the same reason as me, which is to learn how to become a better coyote hunter. Um, I've personally shot a handful of coyotes and a lot of them have just been oppor opportunistic type kills when I've been on other hunts. Um, I've, I've called up a couple, but I'm a novice, got a long ways to go. So our special guest tonight, who you see here on the screen, Mr. Mark Kaiser, um, definitely will not disappoint. He's got a lot of coyote hunting experience from all over the country. He's been doing it for a really long time. And uh, we're going to have a good good time tonight learning from Mr. Kaiser on how to hunt coyotes like a master. Um, I just want to remind everybody to stick around until the end because we are going to be giving away three prize packages to three random winners but you got to stick around until the end in order to be one of those winners so stick with us we got a lot of good content coming down so you definitely won't be bored we're going to have a, a good evening here and we're also going to have a q a session at the end we got a lot of questions submitted leading up to this and we will be taking some live questions through the live q a uh, we got will cooper on here and justin who will be helping to answer some of those live. And then um, for some of those that maybe they can't answer, they will pop those over to us to answer some of those at the end. So uh, we will have uh, sort of an interactive session at the end as well. Um, before I turn it over to Kaiser, I do want to make sure everyone here is familiar with HuntStand. I'm sure most of you are, but uh, HuntStand is the number one hunting and management, hunting and land management app in North America. And when we say that, uh, it's because it's true. There are more hunters and land managers using the app to plan their hunts and go through their land management strategies than any other app there is out there. Um, we do have some competition, but we're thankful to say that we have more people using HuntStand than any of those other apps. And there are a lot of good reasons why. Um, the app is full of robust mapping, weather forecasting, and a whole pile of tools that allow you to e-scout and make the right moves when it's time to hit the field. So it is a very helpful platform from beginning to end in your hunt planning process, uh, all the way down to that final execution. Um, we've got a free version and that's really nice for testing the waters, but then we also have HuntStand Pro and HuntStand Pro Whitetail. Uh, HuntStand Pro is great for all different types of hunting, turkey hunting, waterfowl, big game hunting out west, whitetails, and of course coyotes. But then we've got HuntStand Pro Whitetail, and as the name suggests, that is optimized for really serious whitetail hunters. We've got some custom tools in there, like our whitetail activity forecast, and our nationwide rut map, the first of its kind and still only of its kind, that uh, are super powerful tools in the arsenal for whitetail hunters. So regardless, whatever trips your trigger, I can promise you that if you don't already have a premium version of HuntStand, it is definitely worth every penny of your investment. It will help you a lot in your journey as a hunter, whether you're a, a beginning or, or more beginner or more advanced. Um, once again, before I turn it over to Kaiser, uh, I do want to quickly just go over, like, just lay it out there. What's the point of hunting coyotes? And um, there are a lot of different predators, of course, throughout North America, the coyote being the most prolific. And the reality is that the main benefit of going after these critters is because it's fun. 
Um, just like other wild game, when managed properly, they are a renewable resource and you can have a great time going after coyotes. And they can provide a really cool pelt if you shoot them at the right time of year. Um, in terms of referring to coyotes as a renewable resource, crazy thing about these animals is they are extremely resilient. You can hunt them and you can trap them, but unless you're doing it consistently and aggressively throughout the entire course of the year in most parts of the country, research has proven that it's very, very difficult to knock their numbers down if you're trying to impact deer numbers and fawn recruitment. Um, now that said, if you care about turkeys as well, I think there is some more recent research out there to suggest that even just a, a, a middle amount of coyote hunting can make a difference there for poult recruitment and turkey numbers. But at the end of the day, like I said before, for the average coyote hunter who likes to just get out there a handful of handful of days or times each year, um, it's mainly because it's a really fun excuse to get in the outdoors and hopefully collect some pelts and maybe help some turkey numbers. Or if you hunt them hard enough, you can help those whitetail numbers as well. But we do it because it's it's a great excuse to get out there. Uh, Mark spends a lot of days out there throughout the course of the year. And that said, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Kaiser to, to get this thing rolling. Well, thanks, Josh. <clears throat> I am Mark Kaiser. I'm going to be your game show host today. Just think of me like Drew Carey. Josh, he's going to be like George Greggs. He's got all the prizes back in the studio. So, But we're going to have some fun tonight just like you would out coyote hunting and as josh said nowadays you know when i first started it was all about the pelts i mean it was we never went hunting outside of the first season which is basically october into about right now so coyote hunting was all about the pelts here this is a retro throwback photo you're seeing here of me back in south dakota middle of the winter hanging them up trying to get as many as i can and then I would take them to town and sell the pelts. A lot of times I just sold them right on the carcass just because I had a, uh, a full-time job, just like you guys do now, most of you guys and gals that are watching this. So, uh, but the pelt game is kind of changing. Prices have dropped. And uh, as Josh said, managing, you know, it's a good management tool. If you're really going to manage 100%, you got to throw trapping in there. But if you... You know, if you shoot a cow here or there, especially late in the year, like now when they're when they're breeding and, and getting ready to den, hey, it can make a difference. Flat out, it's all about the fun. So how do you get started? Well, you all have probably heard about the electronic collar. And if you haven't purchased one yet, there's a lot of models out there, obviously. The big thing about electronic collars is they're versatile, very versatile. They have a tremendous library of sounds on them. I mean, there's sounds on there that I don't even know what they are. So the other thing about electronic callers is you can place them away from your calling setup. So if you're in a bush over here, you can walk your caller out over there. And when a coyote comes in, he's probably going to be focused over there. Although, let me tell you, coyotes are pretty savvy. They're always looking when they come in, especially if they've been hunted hard. They're looking for a trap. But that does give you a little bit of a, a benefit in maybe having to move at the last second to get that shot or whatever when the coyote's looking over there. So should you get an electronic collar? Absolutely. Look, look, at, look at them. See what you can afford. They go from 100 bucks up to, I mean, the sky's the limit now. It'll, it'll knock your socks off trying to look at some of these higher-end ones. But if you just want to get into this, and I have looked at some of the questions that uh, you great folks have already sent in, and there were a lot of beginner questions in there, and that's great. It's, this is just a great sport to sharpen up your hunting and have fun in the winter. If you're just getting ready to get into it, a good thing to start out with is a simple hand call, two, three, or four of them. They're very economical you can get them from ten dollars up to twenty dollars thirty dollars depending on which one you're going to get hey that's a lot cheaper than a five hundred dollar uh electronic collar unit that uh you know three four five hundred dollars is probably the average right now a couple of these calls right here hand calls inexpensive you can change the inflection on them so there's a lot you can do as far as volume tone and 
you know, are, is the animal really scared in, in, in hard distress? So I kind of like the hand calls. I always have at least, uh, I got my hand call bag right over there, but I got a probably an even dozen in there right now. So, and the other thing you can do with a hand call or a mouth call, if you want to call them that, as you can do vocalizations and we'll go into a few vocalizations later but simple diaphragm like this and it doesn't even have to be a coyote diaphragm this is uh actually one built for that but i use my elk diaphragms all the time and you can vocalize <coughs> we'll do a little more of that in a minute but i'll just to give you a starter you can go with the e-call but if you're in this at the very beginning and you want to get started a hand call and you know what else you can use to save a lot of money i tell this to everybody especially with coyote fur prices just use your deer rifle you do not need to go out and get a specialized high-end varmint rifle yet you're probably going to want to but not yet so there are some starters get you going economical lightweight versatile crazy amount of sounds on here and you can set it away from you all right let's go on to the next slide Decoys. I love decoys. I'm a decoy kind of guy. I have been since the very start of my hunting career. I just started out with ducks, then I went to turkeys, then I went to deer, then I went to elk, and then it just seemed, well, got to use them for coyotes. So there are basically two types of decoys you can use, and that is the prey and distress decoy that just shakes. That's the one in the upper uh probably be the left of your screen there and it runs on a battery and that will just shake 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 and if coyote sees that that coyote's going to come in and he is going to be just mesmerized by it the other kind of decoy is the one below it and that's a hey right here i got my pal that's a coyote decoy now they make quite a few of these they make 3d models i prefer just because i do a lot of cross-country hunting i like a the two-dimensional, this is the Montana decoy one, and you set it out there, man, this looks, it's just, just a photo, so it looks just like a real coyote, and then it folds up so nice, and you can fit it into your backpack. Uh, you just gotta be careful when it unfolds, it'll knock your socks off, knock your eye out. Those are the two type of decoys. Now, the third decoy you might wanna try, but I would say this is something something you really got to have a lot of time for and that's a decoy dog and you can see my dog right there my dog is actually sitting right beside me right now right here he's uh uh he's an all-around outdoor dog he does everything with me but he digs coyote hunting but there's certain times of years when the dog certain times of the season when a dog works and when a dog doesn't and uh we'll go into that again a little bit further down the road here so coyote decoys they're great for confidence building. Prey decoys, they're great for, again, pulling the attention away to something else. And if you have pairs coming in, especially to a prey decoy that's doing a little bit of flopping, the pairs will get in competition with each other. Not all the time, but a lot of times, especially the adolescent pump, pups, they will start running in a race thinking, I want it first before that one gets it. No, I want it first. And a simple way, if you don't want to spend any money again, for you beginners out there, take some fishing line, a stick, and get a fluffy feather and tie that feather to the end of the stick. Any little wind will make that feather flit, fluff, uh, fly around, and again, catch the attention of a coyote coming in kind of like a turkey decoy when it's spinning just a little bit of wind makes that decoy work so there it is i love decoys i carry a decoy almost with me all the time my dog goes with me almost all the time too but like uh just recently on a hunt i haven't been engaging him because coyote's been a little paranoid right now so he just sits behind me and i actually a lot of times will throw a little camouflage cover over him but he loves to go out. He's my buddy. Doesn't pay for gas, but uh, we're working on that. So let's go to the next slide. All right, gun setup. Hey, <laughs> sky's the limit on this one. Again, it used to be you wanted a varmint rifle, a smaller caliber center fire rifle. You could use a 22. I'm not a big fan of uh, like 22 Magnums and even some of the smaller stuff, 17s. 
mainly because coyotes are tough. They are a tough critter. And, and uh, I prefer something in the caliber of around 22, 250, 223, up to uh, 243. I've been using a six millimeter Creedmoor too a lot just because it was kind of the fad, you know, lately. And I, I don't want to get into if you're six. 6.5 Creedmoor fan or not, everybody's got their likings. But I used to, I have used that a lot. I'm actually switched back to the 22250 right now, and I consider that the ideal caliber. A lot of them out there. You, this is just like, what's the ideal whitetail caliber? We, we can go back and forth on that. But I will say this. I have shot a lot of coyotes when the 204 Ruger came out and used the 204 Ruger on it, and I did notice that they didn't die as fast uh, more of them ran off for some reason I'm, I'm i don't know if the i was having different bullet issues or what it's using basically the same type of uh quick expanding rapid expansion bullet on them but uh that's why I, i'd like just a touch more beef i want my coyotes to know that uh mark's sitting over in the brush over there shooting at them so when they get hit the 22 250 just lets the air out of them 243 will do the same thing Obviously, a 6.5 Creedmoor, it's overkill, will do the same thing. But um, 204 Ruger to 223 to 22250, all great rifles. And then your your rifle scope should just simply be a variable. I'm I, uh, uh, having a fixed uh, rifle scope anymore just, to me, doesn't make sense. Because there's so many situations when you're calling coyotes. So a variable, 6 to 20, 4 to 18, uh, depending again at where, where you're at, where you're living, what's your, what's your main backdrop, how, how far you need to shoot. But, um, coyotes are small when they're out there at 300 yards, they're not a very big target. So, uh, this is my, uh, current rifle setup right now. And, uh, that's a six and a half to 20 Sig Sauer Sierra three on there. It's a, a lighted reticle scope. And, uh, I usually have it set on about uh eight to 12 power depending on what my landscape is i've shot a pile of coyotes with 10 power now i live more in an open environment i lived a good chunk of my life in the uh, great plains over in south dakota moved over to the mountain foothills the mountain west in wyoming now so a little bit longer shots but uh the last coyote i shot not too long ago here was a uh a big male shot him at 60 yards came in hard, came into a challenge. He was wanting to challenge uh, and we we're talking back and forth. So uh, as you get, again, get built into this, you may want to consider a suppressor. I love a suppressor on there because I've vocalized the coyotes a lot and I hate putting earplugs in. In, in. in the old days, again, I was putting earplugs in all the time just in case Kyle would come right away and start shooting. Then I couldn't hear all of a sudden if they were vocalizing back to me. So uh, suppressor that handles it all right there. The other thing you may want to consider on your rifle rig is a rifle rest. I keep a bipod on mine all the time because probably 60, 70, 80% of the time I can go prone in my country. But I also carry with me either shooting sticks or a tripod, again, depending on what I think I'm going to, uh, what's going to happen that day. So, and your bullet, if you want to say furs, should be a rapid expansion bullet something uh something in the uh uh tray or the category of a v max i i shoot a lot of v maxes that's a really good bullet uh 50 grain is what i'm shooting out of that 22 250 right now again with pelt prices where they're at you can shoot a 180 grain bullet out of your 300 win mag and go out and have fun and see what your 300 mag does and and be ready for deer season but uh Looking, if you're looking to get a pelt, want to put it on the wall, even mount a coyote, a rapid expansion bullet is probably the best for it uh, in a smaller caliber. And then, as I said, real quick again, I don't like going much below a 204 Ruger just because uh, coyotes, they are tough. They're a tough critter. They live a tough lifestyle and they live in some rough country and get away. In the east, there's plenty of brush, timber, foothills they can get away to, into. In the west, lots of sagebrush. Uh, gullies, coolies, and stuff they can crawl into. You want to knock them down with one shot. So, all right, next slide. Accessories. Definitely got to have a binocular. Even when you're hunting in timber, I like to have a binocular. 
Same thing with whitetail hunting, elk hunting. I would like to see through the timber. And after about 10, 15 minutes into a setup, if I'm not seeing anything, I want to look out there and see if there's a coyote sitting out there examining. And that happens more and more, it seems like, uh, as, as we're calling coyotes more, they become a little bit more educated. So, and I, and I think the best uh, type of binocular to have for coyote hunting is one that's uh, got the range finder built into it. This here's a um, compact uh, Kilo 6 from uh, Sig Sauer. Nice, lightweight binocular, 10 power. If you're in more timbered country, hey, I can see sticking with an 8 power. I've just always been a 10 power type guy, again, living in a more open country. So get a backpack. The reason I say get a backpack, and I see guys all the time toting these collars around by hand, I'm going to tote this around, and I'm going to have this over here, and the rifle on my back. A lot of times, I mean, not every time I'm out, but a lot of times I've run into coyotes out there. You'll come over a rise, and they'll be out there mousing, and they won't see you, and you might be able to get a shot. Well, then you're putting stuff all the way down. If you got it all in the backpack, you can just slip the pack off or just crawl up and shoot. So I, I like a backpack and I like a bigger backpack. I, I, I haven't used day packs in years because uh, I like to carry the kitchen sink with me. Your layers of clothes, your collar, uh, your decoy, uh, if you got scents with you, all these different things are going to go with you in the field. A bigger backpack. Mine's a 3,800 cubic inch is what, I'm, what I usually use for everything from deer to elk to predators and uh and and i do a little more hiking maybe than the average uh, coyote hunter so i, I carry layers because i don't want to get sweated up but uh having it all in a backpack keeps it organized and hands free so if you would happen to get into a coyote shootout hey might as well take them any way you can that's 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 the way i always look at it a seat to sit down on especially this time of year there's snow um, a lot of moisture look at the west coast what's happening out there right now in the southwest united states everything's wet so you want to sit on a seat and a lot of areas from here all the way into even toward the mississippi river there's cactus and you're gonna you don't want to sit down on a cactus but if you put a seat down uh then then you're sitting on that instead of a um 17 prickly pear cactuses in your rump and then you got to have your hunting buddy pull them out and that gets awkward and I, we don't even want to go into that I always carry garbage bags, big black hefty bags. I sit on them a lot. I actually, if I'm again trying to save weight, I'll use them as my little sitting spot or I'll spread it out. And if I'm prone, I'll lay my chest area on to keep that at least dry uh, down to my groin area. And then you can use that backpack if you shoot a coyote or skin a pelt, put it in there. So your other stuff in your backpack or excuse me, the garbage bag. You can put the coyote in the garbage bag and then stuff it into the backpack. And then your other stuff doesn't get bloody. And I do that same thing, whether I'm packing out elk meat, uh, uh, dead coyotes, quartered up white tail. I like to keep it in a garbage bag just for the short pack out. And then you don't want to take it out so it doesn't obviously uh, uh, get too warm in there. A rope, maybe you're gonna drag your coyotes out. There's a lot of snow, they're pretty easy to drag. I've, I've drug a lot out. And then a knife, uh, if you're gonna do some skinning or just anything, a knife obviously is handy for anything. And then I always keep a little first aid kit in my uh, backpack. I uh, Just enough if something happens. I, I actually usually even carry a tourniquet just because uh, if something major would happen, like you stabbed a knife into your uh, ephemeral artery, a tourniquet could at least help you uh, stay alive a little bit longer. But just even cuts, nicks and stuff, a little bit of gauze, even duct tape or something to tape it up, but just some basic first aid screwing around with knives and stuff you know what happens so all right licensing you do need to pay attention to licensing and i can't go over all of them right now but i um i did make some notes on a few because every state treats their coyotes different some they're they're a game species many they're just a predator or varmint some have seasons most don't and then if you want to hunt them it's just, it's, it's just a gamut of what do you got to buy for a hunting license? Now, in my home state of Wyoming, you don't even need a hunting license. I go next door to Montana, I don't need a hunting license. But if I step on state land in Montana, well, then I got to have the state lands hunting license. 
whether I'm hunting coyotes or deer or whatever. So there's a lot of different things to do. South Dakota, I do a lot of hunting there. I, like I said, I'm from there originally. I can kill coyotes on my big game tag. But if I go over there and just want to hunt coyotes alone, then I got to have the fur harvest permit and the habitat staff. And trust me, you want to check it out because, uh, for instance, I was driving to Kansas this fall to go to a deer hunt. And I had a few extra days, like I'm going to call coyotes there. So on the way down, I get on the phone and call the Kansas Game and Fish office. And the guy that I got on the phone, he didn't even know. And he was going to make me buy all the stuff that I needed for trapping coyotes. And I said, no, I'm just hunting coyotes. And my general permit, my uh, uh, Kansas game permit, general hunting license, it was all I needed. But even he didn't know. And then I got stopped in Montana. Same thing. I was talking with the Montana game warden. It was during a big game season and he, he thought I was big game hunting without orange. And I said, no, I'm just out coyote hunting. And uh, him and I had just a little debate about what I needed for a hunting license there, which was nothing except again, if I was on the state lands. So call ahead, check it out, make sure you got the right licensing because every state is different and every state treats their predators just a little, little bit different, so. E-scouting. This is your friend. Well, actually, that's a picture of my screensaver. But hunt stand is your friend. What are you looking for? What are the basics coyotes uh, they're looking for? So when I'm trying to figure out a good place to call coyotes and I'm sitting at home on my hunt stand hunting app, <clears throat> or maybe I got it called up on my uh, desktop, first thing I look for is rugged thick and dense cover because coyotes, even though they're everywhere across the United States, they still like to escape to where there's not much going on for the most part. Now there are habituated coyotes in suburbia. I'm sure you've all seen them driving around at night, even in the middle of the day, uh, my, uh, my mom lives in Mesa, Arizona, somewhere down there. There's coyotes in the backyard all the time walking across the golf course, uh, up and down the street. So where they're not hunted, you might see them like that. Typically, coyotes are looking for rugged, thick, dense cover where they can get away from you and drive by shootings because that's pretty common, uh, at least out west here when people are driving down the road, there's coyote, and gun rolls out the window, boom. Not saying it's legal, I'm not gonna even go into that, but that, I'm sh I know that happens a lot, especially when guys are going out to check cattle for calving, check on water in the winter. They see a coyote out there. There's a lot of uh, drive-by shootings going on. Next thing I look for is prey density. Coyotes need to eat, just like you. You're looking for a good restaurant. Coyotes are looking for a good restaurant too that has the number one thing they eat. I know, I know people say, oh, they're, they're eating all the deer, they're eating little calves, they're eating all the lambs, uh, and they do. Number one thing they eat uh, on all the research that you look up is mice. They're, they're a rodent eater. They're, they are just incredibly good at mousing and finding rabbits. Right now we've got uh, in my backyard, a ton of rabbits and a ton of mice. I see them all the time when we're out hiking. So I know the coyotes are eating pretty good. So look for prey density. <clears throat> and that prey density can be big game. Big wintering herds of deer and elk, antelope. Again, whatever's in your backyard, turkeys will attract coyotes. Because this time of year, they know there's gonna be a few sick and weak in there. And there'll be something maybe dead in and around that area from roadkill, maybe a mountain lion took them down and they are opportunistic. They will try to get whatever they can to eat. It's not uncommon at all. I'll be driving down the highway at night and your lights shine and there's a roadkill deer in the ditch and two or three coyotes sitting on it. So, and then livestock, coyotes like to hang around livestock and there's a variety of reasons they do that. One, they're hoping that at any given time, one will tip over. Two, they do eat some of their feed. They, they, if coyotes are stressed enough and not getting what they want, they'll go in and pick up whatever grain and stuff they can get. Coyotes eat anything. They're omnivores. They love meat. They love to go to Arby's, but they're not opposed to uh, doing the little vegan lifestyle either and raiding somebody's watermelon patch. So they will eat whatever they can. <clears throat> Livestock really attracts coyotes 
once calving starts or lambing starts or when I don't even what they call goading when goats are dropping goats when that starts cows like to be in and amongst the herds because they're eating after birth and then they're eating that rich milky calf excrement those are great foods that they love after birth's amazing for them they they I mean they won't even they don't even look at the cattle they're just looking for what's ever laying on the ground there this time of year calving season starting if you know where there's cows and they're starting to calve the outskirts of that is an ideal place to set up and call or if the landowner allow you the livestock manager if you can get a little high point get in there in the dark and then catch coyotes leaving the herd at dawn or coming in at dusk that's a good good uh that's my tip for the day right there livestock calving it's starting now <clears throat> good place to set up and call. All right, e-scouting. I mentioned a little bit about it. That phone in your hand, again, is just super when you're at home and when you're out in the field. What does it allow you to do? Well, at home or even sitting in your truck when you pull up to a uh, an approach and you're going to get out and call in the dark. You know, you're, a lot of times uh, you want to be out in the dark hike into your spots to be there at sunrise you can see what's ahead now you're going to get the satellite overlay get a good look at it and you're going to look for any type of openings obviously but you can also start doing overlays on it and one of the overlays that i like uh, one of the features that hunt stand has is their natural atlas which adds topographical lines so i can see the steepness and I'm always looking for high spots. You should always be looking for high spots. Another way to do that, once you start to see, a, maybe you're seeing a knoll here and on the back side of that knoll is a big opening. Then I go into the 3D mapping feature and that allows me to fly through that territory and see what's on there. And then if I see the opening and I see the high spot, I can use the range finder, the navigational tool, and actually do distance estimation, not any estimations, it's exact, to see how far that shot might be. Is it going to be a doable setup? When I'm way up here, the coyote comes down here, is that going to be a, a, a good shot for me to take? Can I handle that distance of shot? I can do all that before I leave the cab of the truck or my office uh, on, my, on my desktop. And then, hey, this, this one, uh, we're gonna talk about this again, but Hunt Zone gives you the wind direction, the wind cone, and then you go into your weather forecast and you can get an idea. Is that wind gonna stay north, northwest all morning? Is it gonna start transitioning to a westerly wind? Now, I've, over the years, I've just come to the point, um, and, and I'll again mention this later, but I hunt any wind. I just want to go hunt coyotes. And I just feel like if I only hunt spots because the wind is supposedly good for that spot, I'm giving up a lot of areas. When I go into an area, I just always know the coyote is going to circle downwind. And there's one little avenue down there. How do you like that? That's, that's one of my big graphics. I've been practicing that all day. There's one little avenue down there that the wind is going to go straight to them. If you can cover that uh, in your shot range, when he comes in, you just got to shoot him before he gets to that alley and you've got, you, you've got command of the wind. So don't get so hung up on the wind as much as getting hung up on the view. And again, e-scouting with the hunt stand app, when you combine all that satellite, topographical lines, uh, looking for property, obviously property info, uh, the public lands, the hunting lands that are telling you where all the public lands are. And then if you see a good piece of property, you think, hey, I want to knock on the door, it gives you the guys, uh, guys and gals information right there, the landowner's information on the property info feature. So lots of good stuff you got in your hand right there that uh and i and i use it all the time when i'm out i'm always calling up uh my maps and trying to figure out uh, a good example here's the other day i was in above this valley and i knew a guy owned it that was an absentee landowner and so i was like for years like oh, i'd never get a hold of him whatever i'm just i'm not even worried about it it just so happened the rancher next door who gives me permission to hunt 
bought that whole valley. That opened up a whole new area for me. And I didn't even know he bought it because, you know, a lot of guys will buy land. They're not just like, you know, telling everybody they did. So good stuff there on your hunt stand hunting app. Let's go to the next one. Boots on the ground. Now, I always say what you see on your hunting app isn't necessarily reflecting the true what's happening on, on the landscape. It's close. It's close. But you definitely should put boots on the ground at some time and confirm those high locations and especially confirm what I was talking about, narrowing down those shooting lanes. So you've got shooting opportunities downwind for sure, but also off to all the sides. Now, some of the coyotes, when I, when I say confirming those shooting lanes, some coyotes, especially adolescents and young of the year and early in the season, they'll just charge in. They won't even fool with the wind. This time of year, any adult coyote that's two or three years old, even a young coyote that's been uh, zipped a couple times with a bullet, he is going to circle downwind. That might not be the same case as in September, October, but February, January, February, March, I, th I think those coyotes, again, every place is different. You know, I'm, tr I'm speaking in generalities here, but those coyotes, they, they've been harassed quite a bit through deer season and now predator season they're going to want to come downwind. And then I look for sign. Now, our snow just melted. We, we had a really good snow for the snow pack for the last week, and it's just melting. Uh, but that is a great way to check for sign. You can see the fresh tracks in the snow. Muddy trails, same thing. Coyotes love following farm trails, ranch trails, deer trails. If you can, I've got some moisture, you can see their tr tracks in there. And then they'll drop uh droppings along the way on those trails along posts a corner post in a fence a dead carcass uh, anytime you come around dead carcass go look at it there'll be all kinds of sign littered around there if there's coyotes there and then the last thing i do is i listen i listen when i'm out coyote hunting obviously but if you want to know if there's coyotes out there uh instead of sitting at home watching netflix get off that couch and go out an hour or so after dark even in the middle of the night and do some howling. Typically that first, oh, right at dusk, the first hour after, that's a good time to get a coyote response. Now, when I grew up in Eastern South Dakota, those coyotes didn't vocalize during the day much at all. That farm country coyote for some reason. Then I moved out here uh, and as I hopscotch across South Dakota and eventually moved out to Wyoming, I talk to coyotes all day long in some of these areas. They'll howl back at me at two in the afternoon, uh, at high noon. So it, it, again, it varies. But that right at sunset, hour after dusk, good time to go out and do a little howling and see if you can get those coyotes to um, answer you. <laughs> Rip a couple howls like that, lone howl it's called, and uh, sit back and see what's out there. And then take your app and you're going to have to, you know, kind of guess a little bit, drop some uh, pins there where those coyote howls are probably at. So you can go back the next morning, next day, two weeks, whatever. That should be their territory. Not always guaranteed, obviously, but if they're just coming out of a bedding area uh, cover, that could be their territory. Basic rules. The basic rule that if you don't remember anything all night long here, you have to see around because coyotes are so sneaky. Again, an educated veteran coyote. They're very sneaky when they come in. You might get out there in October and start calling and have three coyotes run you over and you're like, man, this is great. And then come this time of year when they've all been hunted hard and you're like, where are they? Why are they holding up out there? Why am I not seeing them? One of the rules I always follow real closely is I watch low spots. Coyotes love coming into a position using dips and gullies, and they get in the bottoms of them and come. Now, again, that's a generality. They, they can arrive almost anywhere, but I see them a lot come into those low spots and follow it. And then, like I said, I hunt any wind, but I just want to make sure I can see downwind. And I typically set up with my gun fairly well swung that way because I, I always feel like, well, that's probably where they're going to come in. And then you should study coyote patterns. And what does that mean? 
um, studying a coyote pattern is just like studying a whitetail pattern or a turkey pattern or an elk pattern, whatever. Coyotes typically go from one spot to another. Now you probably think, and there's a lot of truth to this, that they're just out there everywhere wandering around. But think of it this way. If there's a busy road, but you had a bunch of calving around it, those coyotes will probably be down there in the dark, running around that calving operation, hanging out around the buildings, hoping to steal some cat food, hoping to catch a, a stray chicken, whatever. Then at dawn, where are those coyotes going to go? Well, they're not going to hang around that busy road because they know they're going to get a drive-by shooting or, or, or whatever. They just don't want to be around uh, humans for the most part. They're going to go up into cover, whether it's a hill, whether it's more brush, maybe it's a cattail slough, a wetland area. They're going to go that way. So the patterning you need to do is figure out where are these coyotes prefer to hunt the majority of the time, where are they going to go at dawn, and where are they going to come at dusk. And then your job is to call them to where they want to go. They want to come down here at dark. But they're probably not going to make it till dark. So you want to set up somewhere halfway in between. I need a whiteboard here, don't I? Oh, my gosh. And the same way in the morning, those coyotes are down here raiding someone's chicken coop. And they got ducks and geese and sheep. And then they're starting to calve. But at dawn, those coyotes are going to leave that. And they're going to go up into this river break and get into the thicker stuff up there. You want to be somewhere up there waiting for them at at the appropriate time at daylight at shooting light uh, so study coyote patterns try to figure it out now this fall i was down in kansas with my buddy and they come right off the road they just pulled off the road and they said let's go out here it was dark in the morning and sit by this silo and call and i said wouldn't it be better if we went just a little further up the hill and they said nah these coyotes they don't really care they'll they'll come towards a road it, it, you know if, if if we're hidden enough and everything by God, they did. So I, I've been proven wrong a lot. But most of the time, there's a pattern there. Coyotes are coming from hunting, feeding, or refuge and going the opposite directions to try to figure that out. Next slide. And that, that one there, you can see the picture we were just on. That's how I set up a lot when I can. Prone. I'm a way better shot prone. All right, next slide. Coyote circuits. Now, this isn't a, a circus circus. This is a circuit. If you want to go out on an all-day coyote hunt or even a half-day coyote hunt, you got to kind of think ahead. Where am I going to go so I can get the most bang for my buck? First thing you do, you should check for wind. Now, I said you can hunt any wind. But on a circuit, you're going to want to try to go speedy, spot, spot, spot. So you're probably going to want to try to figure out areas you can go and then go in with the wind in your face so you're not ruining a bunch of cover or country behind you with your scent. So typically, if I'm going to run a circuit and try to go as many sets as I can, I do like to leave my ve from my vehicle and go into the wind. And then I might veer off a little bit and do some angles and stuff. So check the wind and stay close to roads. I don't always follow that rule, but stay close to road if you want to go set to set to set. Now that works great in the section line country of America where everything's broken up into one square mile segments. It gets a little bit tricky uh, in the west and, and, and in the uh, mountainous east, uh, say the Appalachians or whatever, where the country is just a, a little more rugged and they can't do that one mile road thing. But if you can, stay close to road. You can walk in half, three quarter mile, do your set. When there's nothing there, come back out the road, go up the road, come out and do your next set, da 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 And again, a lot of this depends on do you have landowner access or are you hunting a big national forest where you can just do that or a state forest or some big state lands. But um, uh, typically staying close to the road means you can get more in during the day. Separate your stands by a mile to three miles. If you're in rough, rugged country, or it's foliated, that country will absorb sound and you can shorten that up. A mile, dis, uh, a mile separation is fine. If you're in big open country, then 
it will go out to three miles. And I've had some different guys, a, a, a couple a gentlemen out of South Dakota was a game, uh, a game and fish employee, state trapper, and they did some testing, uh, howling and vocalizations. And they said they separated by, I believe it was three miles and they could hear each other vocalizing and they had radios or, you know, just to try to see how far it go. And then they could hear coyotes responding even beyond that, where the guy who was actually making the sound couldn't hear that. Now, will a coyote come that far? No, probably not. It, again, it depends. Breeding season, they might it may take them a long time to get there. But if you separate by one up to three miles in bigger open country, you know you're calling to fresh coyotes who haven't heard what you're saying before. Here's a tip. Use livestock, groups of livestock, herds of deer, flocks of turkey. If you know there's like flocks of deer, turkey, whatever, spread out through the area, go from group to group to group. Uh, in my country, we've got a lot of wintering elk. The coyotes like to hang around the elk. They like to hang around the antelope. They love hanging around antelope and harassing them. As speedy as antelope are, they know if they get a weak antelope, it, uh, it's a freebie. So now going back to uh, stay close to the roads, a lot of times I'll fill up my backpack, throw water in, some uh, energy bars, whatnot, and I'll go cross country. I'll just leave the road and I will make a circuit that way. And, and I kind of enjoy doing that because uh, it gets me away from everyone where everyone else is calling. I'm going back a couple miles further and it might be coyotes back in there that hardly ever get close, close to the road just because they got enough prey and stuff up there. So, so you can do cross country hunting and that's when that backpack comes becomes real important as far as carrying all your gear that you want to take with you. All right, next slide. Primary vocalizations and calls. In the early season, when the adolescents, they typically start leaving the dens in August. So August, September, October, anything goes. Any prey and distress sound will work typically. Now, with your hand calls, uh, here's just one tip I do a lot of times. I'll start out with something soft. This is a bird distress sound. Not get too loud with it. And then I can ramp up on that if nothing comes after five, 10 minutes, or I can move on to something else like a um, rabbit that sounds like uh, it's getting shaved and run over by a lawnmower. So prey and distress works all year round. Early in the season, it works really well on coyotes that are just fresh to the game, that haven't heard it. And that's where those coyotes will come in real fast, two or three at a time, and your prey and distress, or your prey decoy can work great then. You probably don't even need a coyote confidence decoy out there. Coyote vocalizations, they work year round because coyotes, like us, we talk all the time. Coyotes talk all the time too. They use their vocalizations to proclaim territory, to tell others to stay out, to invite others in. But there's a variety of ways that they're using vocalizations all year long. So you definitely want to uh, go through the vocalizations on your uh, e-caller and understand what's in that library. Uh, no doubt about that. And then you should know some basics just uh, for you to use, again, maybe you're going cross country. You don't want to take this extra weight in your in your pack. And you just want to throw in a couple calls. Your vocal, your howler. This is the um, stealth yode howler from Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls, and uh, very lightweight. Works great. Again, that and a prey in distress, and you can go four, five, six miles. Maybe call in two or three coyotes. But um, so vocalizations all year long. The few you need to know are the lone howl pack howling, try to sound like several, and then challenge howls and barks. <laughs> Simple lone howl works great. That's all, especially right now, that's all you need to do is go out there and just do a couple, rip a couple of lone howls, and you don't have to get into anything else if you don't want to. And then if you want, sound like a couple, <laughs> Try to 
try to make it just sound like two or three different coyotes talking back and forth to each other. And then the challenge howl is basically the same thing. It's a little bit shorter. And that's telling other coyotes, hey, I'm the big dog here. Stay out of here. Now, any of these can be intimidating to coyotes that have gotten their butt kicked. So it does not work all the time. It's, it's you know, like anything. There's no, there's no magic uh, answer to it all. But like this time of year, February, Valentine's Day, is the love month for coyotes. Their pre-rut is January. Coming into February, they start their breeding. And going into March, they're starting uh, very hard territorial and denning uh, protection. They're protecting their area. So if they hear a stray coyote come in, they're definitely going to be on guard. Or if they, and this happens a lot this time of year, their mate gets shot, hit by a car, whatever, they're looking for their next hookup. So just a simple lone howl could bring a coyote in. Uh, the other day I was, I dropped into a little gully and did some howling and I come back out with this fresh snow and there were tracks right behind me. I'd gotten too low in there mainly because I'd been in there before and the coyotes were coming around on me on the opposite side almost every time. Well, one come in from the roadside, he must cross the road and come up behind me, but his tracks were there as a lone coyote during breeding season. It was definitely looking for a mate. So confidence calls. What are confidence calls? Well, the easiest one is a crow, just like Kyle's crows are everywhere. <laughs> Howls are also confidence calls, by the way. That's a big one. But crows, jays, magpies, and coyote howls. Tell a coyote that, hey, maybe things are okay. There maybe is another coyote over there. Oh, the crows now, they're following that coyote. He must be on a kill. And the magpies, they're all gathering around. And the jays, the same thing. The jays are squawking, saying there's a coyote around there. This all builds confidence for a coyote because then he's thinking, oh, all right, things are okay. It's not Mark Kaiser over there calling. Hey, it's, it's just another coyote, and I'm going to go see what's going on because all the crows are over there, and they know they're going for a free meal. So I had confidence calls almost on every setup. My, my coyotes in my backyard get hunted pretty hard. If me and 200 other guys aren't chasing them on the public lands around here, they actually hire an airplane gunner in this country and he, and he flies the, the county, actually many of the counties here in Wyoming and Montana, when they have problem coyotes, they put a plane up in the air with a shotgunner and go at it. So uh, these coyotes get hit pretty hard. They get a little wary. A little bit of confidence will help. That decoy, that'll build their confidence too. The decoys we talked about er earlier. And then switch sounds. If you're howling, there's no, no reason not to throw in some prey and distress right after it. Do some howling, sit and wait, see if something comes in, five, 10 minutes, and then begin some prey and distress. Like those coyotes that were howling, hey, they got something down and they're killing it. And then sit a little bit, nothing comes in, add some more prey and distress. And then what I like to go to is a little bit of coyote fighting, barking, yipping, growling. And that's coyotes fighting either over food or at this time of year, it's not uncommon coyotes get in a big fight over a mate, over a female, especially if females coming into estrus if they haven't paired up. So adding in any of these sounds throughout your single setup is great. And then going back to your circuit real quick that we talked about earlier, and you don't have to switch slide on this one, but uh, if your first setup doesn't bring in a coyote and you're using just straight up uh, <laughs> prey and distress, try something different on the next one and the next one and the next one. Some days coyotes are just off. They're just not, they just don't, uh, it's just not tripping their trigger, if you know what I mean. And then some days, Hey, everything you throw at them trips their triggers. So definitely keep switching. And you can switch in the middle of your calls. You can be doing prey in distress, uh, a rabbit, and you can go to fall in distress. A lot of times it will not bother a coyote. Most times it will bother a coyote at all. And it may speed them up. If they've hung up on one sound out there, they come into a lamb in distress, and then they're out there at 500 yards just looking, and you don't want to take that shot, and they're just sitting out in a stubble cornfield, 
hey, go to something uh, maybe a little softer, but faster. Just a little bit of change up like that may ignite them. And uh, especially if there's a pair and one starts taking off, the other is going to follow. So, all right, here we go. When to use a decoy? Really, there's no reason never not to use a decoy unless, unless the coyotes in your area have seen one and they've spooked to it. You've, had, you've called them in, they've seen the decoy and they've run off. Or, you know, your neighbor's using one all the time and he's not having any luck. But other than that, I typically put out a decoy. Uh, when I vocalize, I always have either the coyote decoy out or my dog, who's really mad because he wants to come onto the screen right now. But I usually have that going on almost all the time. And then if not, I'll, I'll set out, now again, in June and July, uh, August, when I'm doing summer sets, I'll have a fawn decoy out there. Or again, just one of those furry little flippers so really i don't see a negative to using a decoy at all I, I would use them all year round all seasons but just rotate them spring summer early fall prey decoy is probably the best going into summer or going into fall i mean further start maybe using a a, a coyote decoy and then in the winter right now especially breeding season i, I would not be afraid at all to have coyote decoys out all the time, especially if you're doing a little bit of howling. Decoy placement. That's a big thing on decoy placement. If you're using an electronic call and you're setting your electronic collar out there, especially if you're howling, it's a good idea to set that coyote decoy uh, up right by the right by the howler. What I'll do a lot of time though, is if I'm doing my mouth howling, is I'll set the decoy still down a ways because the coyote probably is not gonna uh, respond right away. So what I wanna do is have that decoy, prey or uh, confidence coyote decoy, I want it upwind to me. And I want it probably 80 to 20 yard, 120 yards out away from me. So the upwind reason is when it sees the decoy out here, it's gonna come between the decoy and me with eyes, hopefully on the decoy and I'm downwind totally. So it's a great way to, again, to divert a coyote's, coyote's attention, get it focused, maybe energize it. And then when his focus is over there, believe me, you're always trying to move and readjust for the shot because coyotes are just so cagey the way they come in. What you see on videos on TV, uh, on YouTube and stuff, uh, it's real, obviously, but most of the time that does not happen in my world. I, I've got coyotes coming in from every direction, 360, it seems like. So uh, having at least where they're focusing on something helps me get ready to redirect and shoot. The goal is to get the coyote between you and the decoy. You're downwind, he's upwind. And then when you set that decoy out or your collar, Definitely use some type of scent eliminating spray on your pants and especially the bottom of your boots, or uh, you could just use some coyote urine on them as well. Because when you go out there, coyotes have, undoubtedly, they have the best nose of anything I've ever hunted, even elk. I think elk are pretty darn good with their nose and white tails too. Coyotes, man, they are just great. So you can, you can actually cover your scent with some coyote urine or if you want them to stop out there before they get to that downwind shooting lane, put a spritz of, uh, uh, of urine on either side of that. And again, if, you, if you're scent eliminated on your boots and everything, that'll make those coyotes when they come in, they'll just oh, hit the brake before they get straight downwind. And again, when they're busy sniffing, just like a buck at a mock scrape, they're distracted, they're attracted, they're distracted and gives you a little bit of window readjust and shoot okay on to the next using decoy dogs <sighs> do not take your wife's shih tzu out and hunt with it it's it, just a good rule good rule to follow maybe it's your husband's shih tzu i know a lot of uh, my buddies have lap dogs no if you're gonna use a dog decoying you definitely have to have a dog that is trained well, 
listens to every command, will not break those commands, and, and is bold. You don't want a uh, dog that's uh, too timid either. Uh, that can get them in trouble. What are the best dogs to use? Undoubtedly, everybody uses a Mountain Cur. That's the breed that everyone goes to. Uh, my buddy Levi Johnson up in Montana, he, he's like, to me, the king of uh, dog decoying, dog uh, tolling, they call it. And uh, that's what he uses. I've kind of went more towards the family pet and been in, using border collies. I'm on my second border collie. And the first one did not get killed by a Kyle, by the way. The first one died of old age. But these uh, uh, border collies are just real intelligent. They pick up on uh, just about everything that I do. If, I'm, if, if we're just going out looking for shed antlers, we're going out uh, scouting, they, they know what's going on. When I put my white camo on and have my rifle, uh, getting it ready to take out into the garage to where we're gonna leave, my dog knows exactly, my border collie knows exactly what we're gonna do. So that said, dogs work the best in spring and summer when coyotes are more territorial, protecting the den sites and they're young. They, it, it's just crazy and if you, if you, if you have never seen it, just go on YouTube and just pull up dog, cow hunting with dogs, blah, blah, blah. They get right in their face. Now, I've been using dogs, uh, and I think I said this earlier, I take my dog with me everywhere. This time of year, he's just kind of sitting there, and I, I, I camouflage him. He just sits there. I have his eyes out, though, because he can pick up a coyote and smell them. If they're coming in behind us and the wind's going behind us and I can't see back there, he knows there's a coyote there, and he lets me know usually can't do much about it, but uh, he's just got an unbelievable nose about him. But in the spring and the summer, coyotes will go head to head with dogs. And I mean head to head. Uh, a lot of my shots when I'm shooting them, coyotes in the summer, 50, 60 yards, sometimes those coyotes are coming even closer. And the coyotes will be so engaged with the dog, I can pick my rifle up in full view of the coyote and shoot it reset up on my uh, tripods or over my backpack, whatever, and shoot that coyote and he will not leave. And try that in the winter, this time of year on a coyote that's uh, 60 yards out there. He's not gonna stand that long for you to do all that. So uh, anyway, coyote, uh, your dog should be trained well. Most of the time, my dogs are right beside me. And then if I need them to go out, I'll just say, get them. And they'll, they let me know I, they've got such great eyes that they've seen the coyotes. Typically I'll, if I'm glass and I see one out there, 600 yards, I'll see it with the binocular before them. But if there's a coyote within 300 yards, which just pops up on a ridge, uh, my Sully boy, he's just, he's, he's on that coyote and locked and he's scanning constantly looking for coyotes beside me. So, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun, but it's not for your just normal pet dog, you know, it's it, the dog definitely has to be trained well to understand commands so it does not get in trouble. You get four or five coyotes come in on a, on a, on a, uh, a dog that's, you know, just doesn't know what's going on and they'll take it down and, and you, you will be hard pressed to find a place to shoot the coyote because of all the action going on. And, the, and that's another big thing. You gotta, you gotta be good on the trigger and have, plenty of, um, uh, you just don't want to be, you know, I'm going to shoot that coyote because your dog could jump into the scene. You just constantly got to be watching what your dog's doing to make sure that it's not in the line of fire with your uh, coyote. All right, next one. Pelts and taxidermy. Uh, as, as we discussed here, pelts aren't worth a whole lot anymore. China is the only market that's really buying much of anything for coyote pelts. And uh, it's just, uh, it's kind of sad because it's such a great renewable resource. It's frost free. I mean, the military's used them for years as, as far as uh, no frost over on their parkas and stuff. But uh, don't even want to get into the politics of why pelts aren't uh, good anymore or not selling. So, but you can do some DI, you can sell the coyotes on the carcass. That's the way I usually do it. We have a buyer I'll drive into town here in the same way when I live in South Dakota. I just take frozen carcasses down there, throw them down, and uh, you divvy out me some cash. If you're looking to do uh, skin your own coyote, which uh, 
which uh, I would suggest if you enjoy doing that stuff, um, they do have a video on hunt stand. Brian Murphy, I believe is the gentleman. In fact, I'm trying to find all my notes here that has that. So just go to hunt stand, put it up in the search engine, you'll find it. And then if you want to mount it or like have it uh, uh, skin tanned or whatever, they just make a great addition to any trophy room. Uh, I even would say, if you like skulls and I'm kind of a skull nut, most of my walls covered in skulls. You can't see it, but, uh, coyote skulls look so cool to clean up and, and you can uh, boil one out, whiten it just like you would a deer skull, set it up on a shelf. Those sharp teeth, they look awesome. So, all right, next slide. Oh, I get to tell stories. I thought that's what I was doing the whole time here, man. All right, so most of my great stories, for me, the, sto the, the stories that I really enjoy have to do with my dog. So the first uh, couple here are gonna do with my dog. Two winters ago, Sully and I were out in De December. Sully, <whistles> Sully, come. <whistles> I can show you Sully if he gets in here. But we were out in December, cold morning, I mean, it was, really really cold probably around zero hovering around zero degrees uh on some public land national forest come here and uh did some howling went into some prey and distress and i saw a coyote come here and i saw a coyote way off do a little circle oh he's getting fat he's going to die this is sully everybody can you say hi hmm? <laughs> he usually howls maybe we can get him to howl in a minute uh Saw this coyote circling way out and got behind me. And I'm like, oh, that one's gone. Don't worry about it. And stayed on the set. And, and this is something I didn't cover. I almost always stay for an hour on every set. I, I never follow that 15 minute rule. So we're getting close to 45, 50 some minutes into the set. And I'm pointed downhill with a nice big opening below me. And behind me is timber, a little bit of opening, but not much. And, and and I was just letting the wind go that way. And it's like, I'll just give that up. You always got to give up, you know, one angle because of the wind. And I told Sully after he, he gets bored. So I said, Sully, go, go get him. And he doesn't know what he's getting, but he's wandering around looking. And I figured, you know, he looks like a coyote out there wandering around. I, he's got a dark vest on. I put on him. And all of a sudden I hear behind me and I'm laying prone. And my neck don't turn like it used to because I'm getting old. And I look, and there's Sully standing behind me, and 80 yards past him is a coyote, and they are in a stare down. And I'm like, now how am I going to get shoot that coyote? The coyote is not leaving. It's just locked on Sully. Deep snow. I mean, it's it's the dead of winter. And so I thought, what the heck? I'm just gonna I'm just gonna roll around. Stay prone, but just roll with the rifle and see if I, that coyote stay. And I did it, and by gosh, that coyote stayed. Except I had one other problem. Sully was right in the way. <laughs> he was between me, the coyote and me, and I couldn't see the coyote anymore, just its head. So I called Sully back. I just real quietly said, Sully, come. Sully, come. And here comes Sully. He's great with commands. He's trying to come right now out of his dog bed. <laughs> and uh, got up to me, and he's right at the end of the suppressor would not get out of the way. And I said, Sully, and he, he knows this command, get behind me, I said, get behind me. And then he got behind me and that coyote stood there the whole time. This is in December. So these coyotes have been hunted by several, there had been several coyote contests in this area already. And not only mention that deer season, elk season, antelope season. And uh, Sully and I got that coyote and we drug it back to the truck and warmed up. It was a cold, cold hunt. Another one, and this actually happened in the same, kind of in the same zip code. My other dog, Sage, was with me and I was shooting an AR at that time. And January, I'm guessing, December, January, same thing. And Sage just laid beside me the whole time. Nothing came in, nothing came in. And my son was actually further down on this other ledge looking off. We were looking into the same kind of creek. And uh, about an hour into it, it's like, ah, oh, nothing's coming. So I dropped the mag out of my AR, cleared it, was putting the mag in. And I told Sage, go, just go play. And she took off. She went down in that drainage. And she's goofing around down there, smelling around. And, um, and I'm moving around with my rifle, 
again, like I said, clearing it and everything. And I look up on the ledge higher up to my left and there's a coyote sitting there. A coyote had come in. I don't know why, well, I suppose when I was unloading the rifle and it sat down just like this uh, sitting coyote decoy. I just sat there and was just mesmerized by Sage down there. Now Sage didn't even see the coyote, but it gave me all I needed to put the magazine back in rack around and you know in an ar it's not real quiet that coyote never looked at me at all dropped the hammer and we got we got a coyote on that set so and then uh one of the coolest setups I ever just in kansas i was uh it's actually it's one of the coyotes that's in the back of that vehicle right there that ranger the water went down in this reservoir it's a big reservoir and i got on the edge and was walking around and i could see this log up against a steep bank and I thought, that's perfect. And then all of a sudden, out of a little low spot, a coyote runs across this open area, up into the trees. Now I'm like, oh, no, that's over. I spooked the only coyote probably, you know, out there and whatever. So I went over that log on the, and had the steep bank behind me and started calling. Out of that same spot, that coyote come running out. And I'm, I would bet $100 that it was the same coyote. And uh, run right up to me, 60-yard shot. So... And that's one thing I did not mention in there. Here's another bonus tip. Are you guys writing this stuff down? Got a pen and paper? <laughs> if you can set up on something steep that the coyotes can't get around you, that's always great. Because then that blocks that backside, especially if you got the wind coming into your face like this, and they'll just shear up that uh, spot. And then the other thing I always try to look at, and it's just like whitetail hunting, I always try to look for funnels, whether it's a coulee, a gully, an uh, a funnel of brush, uh, wetlands, whatever, any type of thing that will direct those coyotes that they'll want to follow to the call. Something that gives them confidence again, they can stay low, something they can hide behind, something they can't get past, like that, I was talking like a, a steep bank or hillside. <clears throat> any way you can funnel them in. And again, it doesn't happen on every setup, but while you're scouting at home on your hunt stand, if you see things like that and then confirm it when you get on site, those are um, those are great, great ways to set up or great places to set up. And then I saw this, and we're going to get into questions and answers here shortly, but I do repeatedly hunt a lot of my properties. Off one uh, small property, not too far from here, I've killed three coyotes already. And the last time I was in there, I called in two more that I never got a shot at. It just keeps refilling itself. Just like we said, it's hard to manage coyotes because the minute one gets pulled out of a territory, there's always another one to go in and uh, refill it. It doesn't usually take, you know, maybe a week or two, three, four weeks at most for coyotes to fill that void back in and set up a new territory, especially if it's a good hunting area for the coyotes. It's got a lot of prey, got the right uh, escape cover, uh, if everything's good, another coyote's going to move in. So you might not want to call it day after day, but if you kill a coyote or don't kill a coyote, it doesn't hurt to call a spot every, you know, every other week or something easily. So next slide. Oh, gosh. I, I, Mark, that was, go, awesome. Josh. that was, that was fantastic. I, I learned a lot and uh, our retention, there are, still a lot of people here watching so uh for everybody who stuck around thank you very much and uh, before we jump to the q a um we're going to reward those of you who stuck around for your chance to win one of these prize packages we got a johnny stewart executioner game caller e-caller a cold steel engage clip point knife a cyclops hl 500 headlamp muddy pro series lumbar 500 pack walkers flex flexible uh, bluetooth neckband for hearing protection and then a HME folding seat cushion, so you don't have to sit on one of those cactuses and have your buddy pick out the pick out the pricklers like Kaiser was saying. He said that gets a little awkward. I'm sure it does. Ugh, I had to I'm do it. Sorry about once. that, but <laughs> yeah, I, I got a, I got one of those, but I won't share it here. Um, <laughs> so the three lucky winners are Rob Walter, Heath Milligan, and Wayne Lewis. We've got your information. We'll be reaching out to get you guys hooked up with your prize packages. So congrats. Congrats. And th thanks for staying the entire seminar. Appreciate that. Absolutely. Now for a little bit of Q and a, um, we'll, we'll keep this relatively short, but uh, 
Number one, um, you know, I think you covered this probably, but this was one that was asked quite a bit. Mornings or evenings? If you had to choose, what are better for going after I'm, coyotes? I'm, I'm a morning guy just because I, I, I seem to work better in the morning. So I like to get up, and this is with any hunting. My elk hunting guy partners hate me for this, but I like to get up early be where I want to be and set up before shooting light and then let things calm. So dawn is uh, my favorite, but I do the same thing at dusk. I'll get there like say an hour before the end of shooting light, uh, try to be, well, even before that, but try to set up. So at the very last few minutes of shooting light, I'm about into that hour set. So uh, dawn and dusk are my two period times and that's because it's low light the coyotes like to move then especially pressured coyotes now not all areas are like that again you know some coyotes just roam around all the time but on pressured coyotes dawn and dusk low light time periods uh this is kind of an interesting one um what do you do about overcalled coyotes that sit out at a thousand yards and just bark at you and it, it depends on the type of country, but one of the things we've done in the past, and uh, sometimes you can do this alone, sometimes it helps to have a partner though, is to have that one person continue the bark off with that coyote. Because he's probably barking. If, you're, uh, if he's going to start barking, you might as well do a little bit of vocalizing back at him to make him you know, at least feel like he's fighting with a coyote. Then the other guy, if he can, and again, this is all terrain driven, get out of sight, make, try to figure out a move on him and cut that distance and then crawl up and shoot him. That doesn't work. You know, like I said, maybe in Appalachia, it won't, it's not going to work, but it, it can work in the Great Plains. It can work on an Iowa cornfield, uh, down, down in Oklahoma. It, again, depends where you're at. Oh, even an Ohio si soybean field, you know, it's, uh, if you can back off, Try to make a move around, come up in a fence line. So you got some cover belly crawl. I do a lot of belly crawling. And, uh, uh, and then the other thing I didn't uh, touch on is when a coyote gets in an argument with you, whether he's doing the bark, which is usually, I don't like what's out there, or he's doing a challenge and they'll bark when they're challenge hauling you too. And I get into a lot of those uh, uh, all the time with coyotes, mimic them. Throw back whatever they're throwing at you, throw back at them. And, and, and you could even give it some more inflection, even sound a little angrier at times. If he's sounding angry, you sound angry. And then eventually, hopefully, one of you will give. You know, we didn't really go in much on buddy hunting or hunting in pairs. And I think that will uh, be something that is related to this next question. Because um, I know that a lot of guys will hunt pairs with like a, a center fire rifle and then a shotgun for if they, in case one sneaks in close. But a lot of people asked um, to learn more about hunting tighter cover um, places like the Southeast. A lot of the content that you see online, especially on YouTube um, is filmed in open country. I think naturally because it's easier to get the film, but obviously there's a more than healthy population uh, East of the Mississippi river as well. So this specific question was, uh, I'm a beginner hunter in the Southeast United States. Um, what are some strategies for hunting that tighter, denser cover? Well, I, I think one of the things is even if it's tight, you still need to look for some type of opening. You can't just have a coyote. You can't be a hunting country that's only got 20, 30 yards at most uh visibility because the coyote he'll, he'll he's just got too many options to get downwind to you and you won't see him so you got to try to find those uh, forest glades uh maybe on the edge of a creek where it's a little bit more open along a creek or frozen ice if you got creeks and rivers in there that's another thing coyotes love to run up and down that frozen ice they uh, that, that's just an open highway for them trail any trails that type of thing and again, that works kind of as a funnel. So if you can find frozen ice, farm trail, old farm trail, hidden in the timber, a, a well-used deer trail, set up along that. And then of course the wind thing is gonna be, a, you know, you've, you've gotta try to figure out the wind on that. But one thing in hill country that you can work that a lot of people don't 
uh, probably even think about is thermals. You know, in the morning, your thermals going down in the afternoon or midday, and it's going to go back up and it's going to come back down. So that can help you as far as where you're going to set up on those slight openings. Rivers and creeks, though, if you're hunting along that, even in thick cover, wind tends to channel up and down the river and creek, you know, uh, unless it's just a hurricane gale type force wind. But, um, and then obviously a shotgun. Uh, I used to carry a rifle and a shotgun a lot, and I've just kind of backed off because it's a lot of weight. But in that tighter cover, there's no reason not to use a, a, a shotgun with BB or, or double lot uh, buckshot. Uh, uh, you know, even a good goose load will work, work to drop a coyote at 30 yards. So, uh, and it can get fast and furious. And that's when you want a shotgun is when you're in tight cover like that. And then, you know, if you're going to use the e-collar, definitely separate it out there. So that coyote's going to go into that opening. You're over on this edge of the opening. Try to push him over to the other side to come in there. Or if you're partnered up, you could choreograph it one guy starts out with this sound over here the next guy starts out with this sound over here and you can maybe try to draw them in that way uh, a little bit closer in that thick cover thick cover is hard on coyotes so they they just always use it to their advantage so you're best off you know getting on that uh getting on your hunt stand app and and trying to find as many openings and such as you can and they don't have to be very big openings it's just kind of think turkey hunting you know, you just want to pull that tom in out of that thicker stuff into one little strut area where he he might want to do a little strutting. Same thing with a coyote, just enough to get him to pop his head out, shoot the shotgun. Definitely, yeah. I know another creative strategy that can work if you are running an e-collar, um, especially if you're hunting in, in flat country, is to actually dual purpose use your tree stands and tower blinds because um, then you have that elevation on them, and even if it's thicker cover, you're shooting down. So generally you can see farther and you can position the e-collar so that they believe it. Uh, otherwise, if you're running a hand call, you know, they probably don't necessarily believe there's a, a coyote hanging up in a tree or something, but um, that actually worked for me. Uh, well, sort of worked for me about a month or so ago. Uh, I did a set in a box blind in a muddy box blind and uh, the setup worked, but the shooter didn't. I, I ended up missing that thing and um, don't know if I'll ever see it again, but that was kind of cool to do. Uh, I'll ask a couple more, uh, a lot of questions. And I think you kind of answered it inadvertently. A lot of questions about hunting at night, using thermal, this question specifically, is it necessary for me to buy thermal equipment or infrared lights? Um, I don't have the money for that stuff. Well, I'd say you pretty well answered it because you didn't talk about night hunting and you do most of your hunting during daylight or hours where you can at least see through your optics. So what do you have to say about uh, that type of deal? Well, and I, I don't do hardly any night hunting. I'm probably going to get into it. As as these coyotes get smarter, that's what why people are going to more night hunting because they just weren't, aren't coming to the calls like they used to. So they're just trying to think ahead. Well, I'll go to night hunting. To get into it uh, fairly inexpensively, just get a uh, spotlight with a red lens over it. And, and they sell them everywhere for predator hunting. Uh, Josh could probably name them all. Uh, name of quite a few right there but um and then just slowly scan as you're calling just keep the scan going so you're not surprised when they come in that's a simple inexpensive easy way to get into it the next cheaper way to get into it is with night vision and that's kind of what the military uses and you're seeing those shade you know through a, a green type haze is what you're looking at for coyotes coming in and those several hundred dollars you can probably get into those and then on the very uh more expensive end are thermal scopes now thermals are great because they you can use them night and day plus uh uh plus they just light up everything you're just seeing that coyote come in perfectly the only bad thing about them is you probably need to be a little bit more elevated because it's not going to show the grass and everything as well so you want to definitely be up a little bit and shooting down or know what's a you know laying out in front of you as far as your shooting uh, area so i'd say if you're if you're just getting into it i just go with a red light if you know there's a lot of coyotes in there 
and 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 you're scanning hey that that's a good way to get started in it without spending a ton of money and you're using your your setup and and probably even a shotgun again if it's close in range so we'll end it with this one playing off the uh the keen senses of the coyote um even if you're awesome with your calls and gear how well hidden must you be what can you really get away with i think on veteran coyotes you need to be camouflaged i i, I you may have seen this but so i got my suppressor is camouflaged the end of my rifle scope is camouflaged the back end isn't as much because i gotta i'm working that but my rifle even my bipod everything is camouflaged head to toe so i'm kind of a camouflage nut <laughs> i like spray paint and uh but i see coyotes all the time come in survey the area they 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 just set up at three four hundred yards out there and they're surveying if they see that something's not right that's like right now when i take my dog and i i'm throwing camouflage over him because they just don't like dogs right now but i as i said i like taking them along but if they see the slightest bit of thing out of place they're gone and a lot of that stuff shimmers in the sun so uh if you can dull it mat it tape it whatever I, I definitely would and cover your face as much as you can with a face mask uh i i think coyotes if you turkey hunt you know it's the same game coyotes have great eyesight turkeys have great great eyesight you got to be camouflaged so for sure man well we're going to close the curtain on this thing it's uh it's pretty sweet we still have almost 400 people hanging with us for this q a but we're gonna Thanks. We're going to close the gates on this hunt class. Mark, where can everybody find you on uh, socials and whatnot? Uh, they can go to markkaiser.com is my website, and there's links there. But on Instagram, I'm Kaiser Mark. On Facebook, it's Mark Kaiser Public Figure. And uh, on X, it's Mark Kaiser. Uh, I probably have the biggest following on Facebook and Instagram are the two that. And, and then I do have some of my old stuff up on YouTube. I put a few tips up there now and then. Uh, and then I definitely have content on hunt stand, you know, right now I've got a, there's an article of mine that you might want to read about. And it's, uh, it's, I think it's, what's it called? Five great tips for, you know, coyote hunting. So it's some stuff that's a little bit more in depth, even than what we talked about here. So go to huntstand.com, go to markkaiser.com. Uh, there's not a whole lot of Mark Kaisers out there in the hunting field. So I don't, you, you'll find me. <laughs> Right on, man. Well, thanks again. Thanks to everybody who stuck around. We'll keep you posted. Uh, make sure you subscribe to the Hunt Stand Field Notes email list. Follow us on social media at Hunt Stand. Go to HuntStand.com. Get that Pro or Pro Whitetail subscription, and we'll keep you posted when we're going to run the next hunt class. Over and out.